I've been thinking about heists, as I do from time to time. When I think about heists, I often go back to the questions that I see posed online a lot, which generally come from GMs who want to run their parties through heists. I usually look at this as a bad idea because a heist is really just a set of procedures that a group of players, a party, can do to try to achieve a goal. And if I, as the GM, set the party onto that path of the heist, I feel like that's too much into pushing them to play something the way I want them to play, as opposed to letting letting them interact with the situation however they want to. That being said, there is definitely an appeal to the heist. And I think the reason why we as GMs fall back to trying to create heist situations is because dungeons, which we run a lot of, don't really lend themselves to heists. And I was thinking about that and thinking some more and thinking, well, why not? Why can't we design and run our dungeons to be more like heists? And I don't think there's anything really stopping us, provided we maybe adjust some of what we do or make some allowances for heist-style shenanigans. I'm going to switch over to the big board. I created this board to hopefully keep myself organized and illustrate what I'm talking about, what we're going to discuss in terms of making our dungeons. And by dungeon, I'm just thinking about any kind of dangerous area. It doesn't have to be one specific thing or another, but making them heist ready, if you will. So over the top here, you can see you have multiple rows. Some of some of these rows are kind of broken up to larger sections, but we've got heist activities in which I'm going to try to break down just in general the sorts of things that happen on heists. They don't always happen in every heist scenario. So this isn't about, but mine doesn't do that, or mine does this. It's just trying to cover the bases. In any, in any given particular situation that might be a heist, we don't have to hit all of these. But these are what we generally see. Underneath that, we have a row that's listing out your, essentially your party tasks, what the party will be doing. And then in terms of from the GM side, because remember, we're not going to have any control over what the party does. Things about the dungeon, and that's split up into kind of multiple sections, some about the layout, about the factions, and then about loot. So the first heist activity is usually the acquisition of the target. The party gets the job somehow. You can think about different movies. In the movie Heat, for example, the bank heist is a job that is delivered to Robert De Niro's character, or it's offered to him. He looks at it, decides to accept the price, and gets the job that way. In terms of our usual D&D, oftentimes the targets come from ye old rumor mill, right? They go, they have parties in the tavern. And they hand the bartender a silver, and the bartender says, well, this is what I've heard. I, there's something, something over here. There's a crypt that's been recently rediscovered. Great. That's what we're going to do. Or something else. But in some way, the party gets the target. Maybe they are given a job by, if they have a, a lord that they answer to or some other employer type, maybe they're just handed an assignment, right? But there's that getting of the job. And the kind of party tasks in the getting of the job are the chasing down of leads, if they're being active in that regard. If it's something that's being offered to them, do they accept it? What does that negotiation look like? In terms of what we as the GM are doing, this one is fairly easy in that we have to make sure that the dungeon layout is just, it's knowable, not the layout, sorry, the dungeon existence is knowable. In other words, it's not something that's hidden and that they're only going to find if they stumble into that particular hex. It's got to be out there somewhere. This crypt, this necropolis, whatever it is, has to be, its existence has to be out in the world in the way, in a way that the party can discover it. That isn't always true with our dungeons. Sometimes we like the fact that it's something that the party has to go and, and kind of bump into. But in terms of the heist and that kind of loop, activity loop, there needs to be a lead for them to get there. So we got to know, we got to know something about it. The next task for a heist is the research and planning phase. We often see this in movies, Ocean's Eleven. They have, usually have a lot of fun with all the different things they're doing to try to figure out the kind of getting the plans to the place, the observations. So we're looking down at what the party's doing. Okay, they're researching the target. What do we know about the necropolis? Cat just needs back there. The party might do some research, go to the libraries, hire some sages. Question other folks, what do we know about this necropolis or whatever the thing is? Maybe they're going to go and observe. 
in Ocean's Eleven, they'd always have the scenes where they go into the casino, watch what the casino bosses are doing, look at the, maybe in another heist, looking at, uh, checking how the guards do their rotations, where are they standing, what is their activity level, they look like they're in shape or not, all that stuff. Those are the observations sorts of things where the party might stake out a location and learn about it or about the faction that controls the target. Okay, this Necropolis has a cult of Orcus operating in it. Well, let's see if we can figure out what they're doing, kind of what they're up to, what they're what they're like. How well organized are they? How well trained do they seem to be? What kind of clothes do they wear? Do they use any kind of symbols or language we need to know about? Then we get on to the pr- preparation. So we've, we've got all this data in. Now we're going to figure out our plan. We need to hire a crew. Do we hire them? Yes or no? We need to outfit them with any kind of special gear or just whatever gear we feel like is necessary. That's all player side of stuff. But on the GM side, in terms of the dungeon, we have to have elements that are, again, knowable and observable. And oftentimes with dungeons, they're not. Oftentimes the dungeon, a hole in the ground, uh, a dark cave, it's uh, inaccessible. There's nobody really coming in or out often. Oftentimes it's not really described. If there is, we might think, well, there must be people coming in or out since there's all kinds of things happening on the inside, but oftentimes materials, either our own or modules and adventures, don't really get into, well, who's coming and going out of this place that we can see? In terms of layout, is the layout knowable in some way? It's a big trope in heists for the party to get floor plans, old, new, partial, complete, that give them an idea of what's where and who's where and all that stuff. But oftentimes with dungeons, we don't have any kind of knowledge of the layout. So maybe we could think about with the dungeons, well, can some of this information leaked out? And there are many ways to do it. We often talk about in old school role-playing games, the map fragments that you'll get in treasure loots. And that could easily not just be overland maps leading to a dungeon, but partial maps that are about the inside of a dungeon. And if the party can get one, maybe use that as a lead to do more research, maybe they can get some pieces of that layout. Is the layout flexible to different approaches? Is something else that we'll want to determine with our dungeon and see if we can improve? Oftentimes, dungeons have a single entrance or egress. And yes, even when they have multiple ones, they tend to be very fixed. But part of the fun with heists is when the party or the protagonist of the heist, whoever's doing it, is able to take advantage of all kinds of unconventional forms of entry and exit. And often with dungeons, just not possible. But we can kind of fix that with what the dungeon is in terms of what kind of building or structure it is, where it is, and how open it is to not only observation, but again, also to that moving in and out. Are there windows? Is there levels that we can see? Is there a roof that we can get into? If it is, say, a cave structure, are there multiple ways in or out? Is there maybe a a river, an underground river system that could be tapped into? Is there some way that we could use tools to maybe drill into a spot that is off the beaten path in terms of traffic. But thinking about how is this dungeon accessible in a flexible way, not just the one or two or three fixed entrances that go to kind of places where the dungeon designer wants the party to go to, but ways that the party can interact with it on their own terms. Could they go to the third floor story and slip in a window? Could they get in from the roof? Could they get in from a secret entrance in the sewers? Or again, make their own entrance somehow? Are those viable? We just want to think about it. We don't need to earmark specific sections as being, here's a viable entrance, here's a viable entrance type thing, but we want to be open to it. So when the party makes a suggestion saying, hmm, the dungeon seems to be located really near this stream or near this other cave network. I wonder if the cave that's not part of the dungeon maybe connects to it somehow, or there's a very thin, thin seal of rock that separates them. Maybe we could use some picks and some axes and some things to kind of get in there on the quiet. Me as the GM, I'm thinking, yeah, that makes total sense. So I'm just going to allow that to be, and therefore it's on the map. So maybe it is something where I look at different structures and say, sure, maybe this isn't a mansion that's above ground. Maybe it has some underground areas, but isn't completely underground. Therefore, there are all kinds of ways into that house. Or maybe I look at it and say, yeah, this natural location, it is a bunch of caves and caverns, but I'm going to open things up a bit and allow it to be more flexible. In terms of observations, If we're going to have the party go and try to observe what's going on, there needs to be activity, which means that there needs to be some kind of controlling faction that's observable. Why do I say controlling faction? Because if it's just various things coming in and out with no real relation, you can't build a plan around that. You can't build a plan if I'm watching for any given wandering creature that just 
goes in and out. That doesn't tell me anything about patterns. And the whole point of the observations is to come up with patterns. And patterns are important because that's what I'm setting up my plans on. I'm trying to beat the pattern. If there are gaps in their patrols, if there are ways in which they do things that I can exploit, those are all patterns. We need patterns. So ultimately, we need some faction that's going to be observable, that's going to be dominant so that there will be patterns. And then if we can find gaps in those patterns and exploit them, that will be useful. If it's just some wandering creature, that's not useful. I could not tell you. No one could guess whether that same wandering creature will be back when we tend to go in the dungeon. Therefore, me watching what the owl bear is doing doesn't do me a lick of good. I need something that I can say is reasonably in control, that's dominant, that is going to be organized. And I can use that organization to my advantage, just as they are going to use that organization to their advantage. And then just really following up on that, the organization part. This allows for the patterns of behavior, which I kind of just went through. I have to know that. I did forget one thing down here in terms of loot. When you think about a heist, usually they're going for something. Treasure, uh, a particular item. You could think about different types of fiction. It could be anything. In terms of our dungeons, there should be some prize loot that's, again, knowable. If it's just a big bunch of gold, then that has to be kind of known that, yeah, there's a big bunch of gold that was buried with somebody in that necropolis. Okay. If it's a magic item or some kind of MacGuffin, also got to be known. So just before I get too far, think about that. These other steps after the observation is really all up to the party to do or not do as they want to see fit. If they go through this first part and they just decide to run and gun and just head in the dungeon, just like a dungeon, that's great. doesn't do any harm to any of this kind of prep because all this prep I think that we're doing to make it heist ready, I think is good prep regardless of whether the party ends up taking it as a heist or not. So if decide not to, it's no skin off my nose. This stuff will be in will come in handy for me whether they decide to run it as a heist or not. After they've done all the prep work, they've done all their research, okay, it's time to do the actual the operation. And now that they set their plans in motion, of course, these plans will be wildly variable depending on what the party does. And at that point, you've got your dungeon, you've got it set up, you've put all the pieces in place. Now everything just goes into motion. There's no particular prep you need to do from here at this stage that you haven't done already. But the next up is the twist. Now, the twist is something that the party doesn't do. It generally happens to them, which is there's almost always something that they didn't expect. Fly and the ointment, something that comes along, and, or more than one thing that the party or the protagonists have to deal with. This is something that it could just be wandering creatures, depending on the dungeon, but we can kind of bake in some things about what information and what sort of data has leaked out. and how that data actually reflects the reality. They've got the map or the partial map. They've got this, these ideas about what's going on from what they've observed, but they're not observing everything. So some things might not be what they expected. In terms of layout, either the layout was incomplete, what they had, their information about it. So something is not where they thought it was or something is blocking where they thought it was, just or it's just different. So they might get in following their little map fragment or that piece thinking they're going to get where they need to go. Suddenly, something's not right. So that creates a, an obstacle that they need to overcome. It could be that there is a major faction or individual that was hidden and is now revealed. So they'd seen the cult of Orcus, but they didn't know that there were some demons down there or a vampire or somebody else that was either pulling the strings or was brought in by Orcus as some kind of intermediary, or there, maybe there's someone else entirely. This is where you could have some kind of double cross. It was the, the mayor was involved all along. Something is in there, and now it's revealed, and that, of course, that causes an obstacle. Along with that, maybe one of the crew, if they hired on some crew that's not a, a player character, maybe one of those was dirty, or they were uh, they were a spy for the other side all along, or they somewhere along the way they got coerced by the other side. But there's some kind of betrayal, and then also maybe they get to the prize and it's not what they thought it was. This happens fairly often in heist films where they're after a certain thing. Maybe they're going to get it out because they think this is for the good guys, and they realize when they get down there, oh gosh, this is bad. And we're actually, this seems like something that the bad guys would want, not the good guys. Are we the baddies? What do we do? And then, of course, it's just fun to see what happens when they deal with all this stuff going in, the heist, the twist, all of that, right? And at the end, we get to the result of the heist. And this is kind of your aftermath, period. Really only two states. Either the party succeeds or they fail. And failure here doesn't mean it's like TPK. It means that they leave without getting what they came for. Either they're beaten back, they're forced to flee, or they are, in fact, defeated. But in any case, that prize, whatever was there, is they were not able to retrieve it successfully. 
if they are successful, what happens to the dungeon space? The dungeon layout may be changed due to the attempt of the heist. If there are some creatures that are still there who occupy the place permanently, they probably want to fix whatever the party's done. If the party blew a hole in the roof, they're probably going to want to patch the roof. If the party took advantage of something, they're probably going to want to fix it unless the whole place is abandoned. On a failure, the same thing. If certainly, if they fail and they got in a certain way, you could probably count on if the denizens of this place have the opportunity to, to fix and bolster their defenses, they're going to do it. It only makes sense. If the party succeeds, then the controlling faction defeated, there's a good chance they might be replaced by another faction, either a sub-faction, right? The, whoever was in charge that let this, let this heist happen to them might get replaced, or they are just dispersed, and then someone else will come in and have the dungeon or something else. But there's chances are there's going to be some kind of regime change in, in one way or another. Obviously, the, the prize would be gone. But if the if the faction is successful in beating off the this attempted robbery, then probably they're going to be bolstered. They're going to gain uh, renown. They're going maybe new followers will come. Maybe that whatever they're pushing towards is going to be accelerated because they've shown real power in defending it. And the party now will have to not only presume that they still want the prize, will have to not only take on who's left behind, but maybe even new forces that have come to help out. And then, of course, the prize itself, good chance it's going to be moved or it's going to be even better defended. If it can't, especially if it can't be moved, circumstances are going to change. You're probably not going to be able to count on that information about the prize that you had before. If it has to be there and they can't move it because it's their headquarters, they have nowhere else to go, you're probably going to do some things with that. And there's your heist. And I don't think looking at these kind of things from the dungeon design perspective, from the GM side of the screen i don't think we really have to change too much but i think there are benefits to these looking at these act actions like this looking at these potential activities and preparing for them because i think they end up creating more dynamic places we end up having these stories that we can construct about these factions these factions what are they doing in a certain place how are they placing themselves there how are they organizing themselves there how are they interacting with the outside world because for the heist they really have to in some way because remember they have to be observable but that makes us think about, okay, well, if there's a town somewhere and there's the this location over here and there's a faction over here, they probably interact with the town in some way. Maybe there are some members of the town who are complicit members of the faction. Maybe the faction does some kind of skullduggery in there. But we, th we have to start thinking about things like, well, if they're eating, where are they getting their food from? Well, there are farms around, so how are they interacting with those farms? These are all good questions. And once we start asking those questions and of ourselves, once the party knows that they can ask those kinds of questions and get meaningful, actionable answers, I think they're most likely to do that. And they do that. And in the end, we end up coming up with much more dynamic, fun, interesting places that are going to allow for a lot more different approaches to for the party to explore how to deal with them. Touching back on what I just said, I think the really the biggest thing here is the party, the players need to be aware that they can do these things. This is something that I would want to talk to my players about and say, listen, we look about kind of the the doctrines of tactical dungeon delving, these things that you do that have that help you move through the dungeon effectively. We can look at this and say, maybe this is the operational. That was kind of a tactical level of doctrine of things we can do. We can look at this and say, this is the operational layer. Here, we're, we're not at that tactical layer. We haven't gotten to the place. We're not doing it. That's in that, that operation segment. Setting the plans in motion, that would break out and you would zoom into that tactical level. These other parts are part of operations. But here we can create kind of an operations game loop, if you want to call it, some operational doctrines that we can call on to do things, which I think are really valuable. I think they're fun. I think they they bring in different elements of play, because if we think of dungeon crawling, it's going to have a little bit of social stuff. It's going to have some exploration. It's probably going to have some combat. If we look at these operational side, you're going to have some of downtime potential activities, and that's interesting to you more kind of puzzly things in the preparation and the research. There's certainly probably going to be social elements if you're following people around and questioning people and talking to sages and doing all that stuff. So it's going to fire up some different parts of the spectrum of things that are included in an RPG. I think it will open up your players to really looking at different ways to tackle situations. As us as GMs, I think it fires up a lot of our creativity in different ways for how we can present our dungeons. But for all that to happen, we have to do the work on our side, and we have to let the players know you can do this work on your side, and you will be rewarded for it. I think that's really important.
But that's all I've got. I hope this helps. I hope you maybe look at this and think, geez, the next time I run a dungeon, maybe I can create it to be more heist friendly. I can let the players know that there are options out there. There are ways for them to get information besides just kicking down the door of the dungeon and rushing right in. Maybe they'll bite on it. Maybe they won't. I think this will be fun and useful approach regardless. That's all I have to now, folks. Let me know what you think. Game on, and I'll talk to you later. Bye now.